Passage 1. A Private Conversation Last week, I went to the theatre. I had a very good seat. The play was very interesting. I did not enjoy it. A young man and a young woman were sitting behind me. They were talking loudly. I got very angry. I could not hear the actors. I turned round. I looked at the man and the woman angrily. They did not pay any attention. In the end, I could not bear it. I turned round again. I can't hear a word, I said angrily. It's none of your business, the young man said rudely. This is a private conversation. Passage 2 Breakfast or lunch? It was Sunday. I never get up early on Sundays. I sometimes stay in bed until lunchtime. Last Sunday, I got up very late. I looked out of the window. It was dark outside. What a day, I thought. It's raining again. Just then, the telephone rang. It was my Aunt Lucy. I've just arrived by train, she said. I'm coming to see you. But I'm still having breakfast, I said. What are you doing, she asked. I'm having breakfast, I repeated. Dear me, she said. Do you always get up so late? It's one o'clock. Passage 3 Please send me a card. Postcards always spoil my holidays. Last summer I went to Italy. I visited museums and sat in public gardens. A friendly waiter taught me a few words of Italian. Then he lent me a book. I read a few lines, but I did not understand a word. Every day I thought about postcards. My holidays passed quickly, but I did not send any cards to my friends. On the last day, I made a big decision. I got up early and bought 37 cards. I spent the whole day in my room, but I did not write a single card. Passage 4. An exciting trip. I have just received a letter from my brother Tim. He is in Australia. He has been there for six months. Tim is an engineer. He is working for a big firm and he has already visited a great number of different places in Australia. He has just bought an Australian car and has gone to Alice Springs, a small town in the centre of Australia. He will soon visit Darwin. From there, he will fly to Perth. My brother has never been abroad before, so he is finding this trip very exciting. Passage 5. No Wrong Numbers. Mr. James Scott has a garage in Silbury, and now he has just bought another garage in Pinhurst. Pinhurst is only five miles from Silbury, but Mr. Scott cannot get a telephone for his new garage, so he has just bought 12 pigeons. Yesterday, a pigeon carried the first message from Pinhurst to Silbury. The bird covered the distance in three minutes. Up to now, Mr. Scott has sent a great many requests for spare parts and other urgent messages from one garage to the other. In this way, he has begun his own private telephone service. Passage 6. Percy Buttons. I have just moved to a house in Bridge Street. Yesterday a beggar knocked at my door. 
he asked me for a meal and a glass of beer. In return for this, the beggar stood on his head and sang songs. I gave him a meal. He ate the food and drank the beer. Then he put a piece of cheese in his pocket and went away. Later a neighbor told me about him. Everybody knows him. His name is Percy Buttons. He calls at every house in the street once a month and always asks for a meal and a glass of beer. Passage 7 Too Late The plane was lit and detectives were waiting at the airport all morning. They were expecting a valuable parcel of diamonds from South Africa. A few hours earlier, someone had told the police that thieves would try and steal the diamonds. When the plane arrived, some of the detectives were waiting inside the main building, while others were waiting on the airfield. Two men took the parcel off the plane and carried it into the customs house. While two detectives were keeping guard at the door, two others opened the parcel. To their surprise, the precious parcel was full of stones and sand. Passage 8. The Best and the Worst Joe Saunders has the most beautiful garden in our town. Nearly everybody enters for the nicest garden competition each year, but Joe wins every time. Bill Frith's garden is larger than Joe's. Bill works harder than Joe and grows more flowers and vegetables, but Joe's garden is more interesting. He has made neat paths and has built a wooden bridge over a pool. I like gardens too, but I do not like hard work. Every year I enter for the garden competition too, and I always win a little prize for the worst garden in the town. Passage 9 A Cold Welcome On Wednesday evening, we went to the town hall. It was the last day of the year, and a large crowd of people had gathered under the town hall clock. It would strike twelve in twenty minutes time. Fifteen minutes passed and then at five to twelve the clock stopped. The big minute hand did not move. We waited and waited but nothing happened. Suddenly someone shouted it's two minutes past twelve. The clock has stopped. I looked at my watch. It was true. The big clock refused to welcome the new year. At that moment, everybody began to laugh and sing. Passage 10 Not for Jazz We have an old musical instrument. It is called a clavichord. It was made in Germany in 1681. Our clavichord is kept in the living room. It has belonged to our family for a long time. The instrument was bought by my grandfather many years ago. Recently, it was damaged by a visitor. She tried to play jazz on it. She struck the keys too hard and two of the strings were broken. My father was shocked. Now we are not allowed to touch it. It is being repaired by a friend of my father's. Passage 11 One good turn deserves another. I was having dinner at a restaurant when Harry Steele came in. Harry worked in a lawyer's office years ago, but he is now working at a bank. He gets a good salary, but he always borrows money from his friends 
and never pays it back. Harry saw me and came and sat at the same table. He has never borrowed money from me. While he was eating, I asked him to lend me two pounds. To my surprise, he gave me the money immediately. I have never borrowed any money from you, Harry said. So now, you can pay for my dinner. Passage 12 Goodbye and good luck. Our neighbour, Captain Charles Allison, will sail from Portsmouth tomorrow. We shall meet him at the harbour early in the morning. He will be in his small boat, Topsail. Topsail is a famous little boat. It has sailed across the Atlantic many times. Captain Allison will set out at eight o'clock, so we shall have plenty of time. We shall see his boat, and then we shall say goodbye to him. He will be away for two months. We are very proud of him. He will take part in an important race across the Atlantic. Passage 13 The Greenwood Boys The Greenwood Boys are a group of popular singers. At present they are visiting all parts of the country. They will be arriving here tomorrow. They will be coming by train and most of the young people in the town will be meeting them at the station. Tomorrow evening, they will be singing at the Workers' Club. The Greenwood boys will be staying for five days. During this time, they will give five performances. As usual, the police will have a difficult time. They will be trying to keep order. It is always the same on these occasions. Passage 14 Do you speak English? I had an amusing experience last year. After I had left a small village in the south of France, I drove on to the next town. On the way, a young man waved to me. I stopped, and he asked me for a lift. As soon as he had got into the car, I said good morning to him in French, and he replied in the same language. Apart from a few words, I do not know any French at all. Neither of us spoke during the journey. I had nearly reached the town when the young man suddenly said, very slowly, Do you speak English? As I soon learnt, he was English himself. Passage 15 Good News The secretary told me that Mr. Harmsworth would see me. I felt very nervous when I went into his office. He did not look up from his desk when I entered. After I had sat down, he said that business was very bad. He told me that the firm could not afford to pay such large salaries. Twenty people had already left. I knew that my turn had come. Mr. Harmsworth, I said in a weak voice, don't interrupt, he said. Then he smiled and told me I would receive an extra hundred pounds a year. Passage 16 A Polite Request If you park your car in the wrong place, a traffic policeman will soon find it. You will be very lucky if he lets you go without a ticket. However, this does not always happen. Traffic police are sometimes very polite. During a holiday in Sweden, I found this note on my car. Sir, we welcome you to our city. This is a no-parking area. 
you will enjoy your stay here if you pay attention to our street signs. This note is only a reminder. If you receive a request like this, you cannot fail to obey it. Passage 17 Always young My Aunt Jennifer is an actress. She must be at least 35 years old. In spite of this, she often appears on the stage as a young girl. Jennifer will have to take part in a new play soon. This time, she will be a girl of 17. In the play, she must appear in a bright red dress and long black stockings. Last year, in another play, she had to wear short socks and a bright orange-colored dress. If anyone ever asks her how old she is, she always answers, My dear, it must be terrible to be grown up. Passage 18 He often does this. After I had had lunch at a village inn, I looked for my bag. I had left it on a chair beside the door, and now it wasn't there. As I was looking for it, the innkeeper came in. Did you have a good meal? he asked. Yes, thank you, I answered. But I can't pay the bill. I haven't got my bag. The innkeeper smiled and immediately went out. In a few minutes, he returned with my bag and gave it back to me. I'm very sorry, he said. My dog had taken it into the garden. He often does this. Passage 19 Sold Out The play may begin at any moment, I said. It may have begun already, Susan answered. I hurried to the ticket office. May I have two tickets, please, I asked. I'm sorry, we've sold out, the girl said. What a pity, Susan exclaimed. Just then, a man hurried to the ticket office. Can I return these two tickets? he asked. Certainly, the girl said. I went back to the ticket office at once. Could I have those two tickets, please? I asked. Certainly, the girl said. But they are for next Wednesday's performance. Do you still want them? I might as well have them, I said sadly. Passage 20 one man in a boat. Fishing is my favorite sport. I often fish for hours without catching anything. But this does not worry me. Some fishermen are unlucky. Instead of catching fish, they catch old boots and rubbish. I am even less lucky. I never catch anything, not even old boots. After having spent Whole mornings on the river, I always go home with an empty bag. You must give up fishing, my friends say. It's a waste of time. But they don't realize one important thing. I'm not interested in fishing. I am only interested in sitting in a boat and doing nothing at all. Passage 21. Mad or not? Aeroplanes are slowly driving me mad. I live near an airport and passing planes can be heard night and day. The airport was built during the war, but for some reason it could not be used then. Last year, however, it came into use. Over a hundred people must have been driven away from their homes by the noise. I am one of the few people left. 
Sometimes I think this house will be knocked down by a passing plane. I have been offered a large sum of money to go away, but I am determined to stay here. Everybody says I must be mad, and they are probably right. Passage 22. A glass envelope. My daughter, Jane, never dreamed of receiving a letter from a girl of her own age in Holland. Last year, we were travelling across the Channel, and Jane put a piece of paper with her name and address on it into a bottle. She threw the bottle into the sea. She never thought of it again. But ten months later, she received a letter from a girl in Holland. Both girls write to each other regularly now. However, they have decided to use the post office. Letters will cost a little more, but they will certainly travel faster. Passage 23 A New House I had a letter from my sister yesterday. She lives in Nigeria. In her letter, she said that she would come to England next year. If she comes, she will get a surprise. We are now living in a beautiful new house in the country. Work on it had begun before my sister left. The house was completed five months ago. In my letter, I told her that she could stay with us. The house has many large rooms, and there is a lovely garden. It is a very modern house, so it looks strange to some people. It must be the only modern house in the district. Passage 24. It could be worse. I entered the hotel manager's office and sat down. I had just lost fifty pounds, and I felt very upset. I left the money in my room, I said, and it's not there now. The manager was sympathetic, but he could do nothing. Everyone's losing money these days, he said. He started to complain about this wicked world, but was interrupted by a knock at the door. A girl came in and put an envelope on his desk. It contained fifty pounds. I found this outside this gentleman's room, she said. Well, I said to the manager, there is still some honesty in this world. Passage 25. Do the English speak English? I arrived in London at last. The railway station was big, black, and dark. I did not know the way to my hotel, so I asked a porter. I not only spoke English very carefully, but very clearly as well. The porter, however, could not understand me. I repeated my question several times, and at last he understood. He answered me, but he spoke neither slowly nor clearly. I am a foreigner, I said. Then he spoke slowly, but I could not understand him. My teacher never spoke English like that. The porter and I looked at each other and smiled. Then he said something, and I understood it. You'll soon learn English, he said. I wonder. In England, each man speaks a different language. The English understand each other, but I don't understand them. Do they speak English? Passage 26. The Best Art Critic. I am an art student 
and I paint a lot of pictures. Many people pretend that they understand modern art. They always tell you what a picture is about. Of course, many pictures are not about anything. They are just pretty patterns. We like them in the same way that we like pretty curtain material. I think that young children often appreciate modern pictures better than anyone else. They notice more. My sister is only seven, but she always tells me whether my pictures are good or not. She came into my room yesterday. What are you doing? she asked. I'm hanging this picture on the wall, I answered. It's a new one. Do you like it? She looked at it critically for a moment. It's all right, she said. But isn't it upside down? I looked at it again. She was right. It was. Passage 27 A Wet Night Late in the afternoon, the boys put up their tent in the middle of a field. As soon as this was done, they cooked a meal over an open fire. They were all hungry, and the food smelt good. After a wonderful meal, they told stories and sang songs by the campfire. But sometime later, it began to rain. The boys felt tired, so they put out the fire and crept into their tent. Their sleeping bags were warm and comfortable, so they all slept soundly. In the middle of the night, two boys woke up and began shouting. The tent was full of water. They all leapt out of their sleeping bags and hurried outside. It was raining heavily, and they found that a stream had formed in the field. The stream wound its way across the field and then flowed right under their tent. Passage 28 No Parking Jasper White is one of those rare people who believes in ancient myths. He has just bought a new house in the city, but ever since he moved in, he has had trouble with motorists. When he returns home at night, he always finds that someone has parked a car outside his gate. Because of this, he has not been able to get his own car into his garage even once. Jasper has put up no parking signs outside his gate, but these have not had any effect. Now he has put an ugly stone head over the gate. It is one of the ugliest faces I have ever seen. I asked him what it was, and he told me that it was Medusa, the Gorgon. Jasper hopes that she will turn motorists to stone, but none of them has been turned to stone yet. Passage 29 Taxi Captain Ben Fawcett has bought an unusual taxi and has begun a new service. The taxi is a small Swiss aeroplane called a Pilatus Porter. This wonderful plane can carry seven passengers. The most surprising thing about it, however, is that it can land anywhere, on snow, water, or even on a ploughed field. Captain Fawcett's first passenger was a doctor who flew from Birmingham to a lonely village in the Welsh mountains. Since then, Captain Fawcett has flown passengers to many unusual places. Once he landed on the roof of a block of flats, and on another occasion he landed in a deserted car park. Captain Fawcett has just refused a strange request from a businessman. 
the man wanted to fly to Rockall, a lonely island in the Atlantic Ocean. But Captain Fawcett did not take him, because the trip was too dangerous. Passage 30 Football or Polo The Whale is a small river that cuts across the park near my home. I like sitting by the whale on fine afternoons. It was warm last Sunday, so I went and sat on the river bank as usual. Some children were playing games on the bank, and there were some people rowing on the river. Suddenly, one of the children kicked a ball very hard, and it went towards a passing boat. Some people on the bank called out to the man in the boat, but he did not hear them. The ball struck him so hard that he nearly fell into the water. I turned to look at the children, but there weren't any in sight. They had all run away. The man laughed when he realized what had happened. He called out to the children and threw the ball back to the bank. Passage 31, Success Story Yesterday afternoon, Frank Hawkins was telling me about his experiences as a young man. Frank is now the head of a very large business company, but as a boy, he used to work in a small shop. It was his job to repair bicycles, and at that time he used to work 14 hours a day. He saved money for years, and in 1938 he bought a small workshop of his own. During the war, Frank used to make spare parts for aeroplanes. At that time he had two helpers. By the end of the war, the small workshop had become a large factory, which employed 728 people. Frank smiled when he remembered his hard early years and the long road to success. He was still smiling when the door opened and his wife came in. She wanted him to repair their son's bicycle. Passage 32 Shopping Made Easy People are not so honest as they once were. The temptation to steal is greater than ever before, especially in large shops. A detective recently watched a well-dressed woman who always went into a large store on Monday mornings. One Monday, there were fewer people in the shop than usual when the woman came in, so it was easier for the detective to watch her. The woman first bought a few small articles. After a little time, she chose one of the most expensive dresses in the shop and handed it to an assistant who wrapped it up for her as quickly as possible. Then the woman simply took the parcel and walked out of the shop without paying. When she was arrested, the detective found out that the shop assistant was her daughter. The girl gave her mother a free dress once a week. Passage 33 Out of the Darkness Nearly a week passed before the girl was able to explain what had happened to her. One afternoon, she set out from the coast in a small boat and was caught in a storm. Towards evening, the boat struck a rock, and the girl jumped into the sea. Then she swam to the shore, after spending the whole night in the water. During that time, she covered a distance of eight miles. Early next morning, she saw a light ahead. She knew she was near the shore because the light was high up on the cliffs. On arriving at the shore, the girl struggled up the cliff towards the light she had seen. That was all she remembered. When she woke up a day later, she found herself in hospital. Passage 
34. Quick work. Ted Robinson has been worried all the week. Last Tuesday, he received a letter from the local police. In the letter, he was asked to call at the station. Ted wondered why he was wanted by the police, but he went to the station yesterday and now he is not worried any more. At the station, he was told by a smiling policeman that his bicycle had been found. Five days ago, the policeman told him, the bicycle was picked up in a small village 400 miles away. It is now being sent to his home by train. Ted was most surprised when he heard the news. He was amused too, because he never expected the bicycle to be found. It was stolen 20 years ago, when Ted was a boy of 15. Passage 35 Stop Thief Roy Trenton used to drive a taxi. A short while ago, however, he became a bus driver, and he has not regretted it. He is finding his new work far more exciting. When he was driving along Catford Street recently, he saw two thieves rush out of a shop and run towards a waiting car. One of them was carrying a bag full of money. Roy acted quickly and drove the bus straight at the thieves. The one with the money got such a fright that he dropped the bag. As the thieves were trying to get away in their car, Roy drove his bus into the back of it. While the battered car was moving away, Roy stopped his bus and telephoned the police. The thieves' car was badly damaged and easy to recognize. Shortly afterwards, the police stopped the car and both men were arrested. Passage 36 Across the Channel Erna Hart is going to swim across the English Channel tomorrow. She is going to set out from the French coast at five o'clock in the morning. Erna is only 14 years old and she hopes to set up a new world record. She is a strong swimmer and many people feel that she is sure to succeed. Erna's father will set out with her in a small boat. Mr. Hart has trained his daughter for years. Tomorrow he will be watching her anxiously as she swims the long distance to England. Erna intends to take short rests every two hours. She will have something to drink, but she will not eat any solid food. Most of Erna's school friends will be waiting for her on the English coast. Among them will be Erna's mother, who swam the channel herself when she was a girl. Passage 37 The Olympic Games the Olympic Games will be held in our country in four years' time. As a great many people will be visiting the country, the government will be building new hotels, an immense stadium, and a fine new swimming pool. They will also be building new roads and a special railway line. The Games will be held just outside the capital, and the whole area will be called Olympic City. Workers will have completed the new roads by the end of this year. By the end of next year, they will have finished work on the new stadium. The fine modern buildings have been designed by Kurt Gunter. Everybody will be watching anxiously as the new buildings go up. We are all very excited and are looking forward to the Olympic Games because they have never been held before in this country. Passage 38 Everything except the weather My old friend Harrison 
had lived in the Mediterranean for many years before he returned to England. He had often dreamed of retiring in England and had planned to settle down in the country. He had no sooner returned than he bought a fine house and went to live there. Almost immediately, he began to complain about the weather. For even though it was still summer, it rained continually and it was often bitterly cold. After so many years of sunshine, Harrison got a shock. He acted as if he had never lived in England before. In the end, it was more than he could bear. He had hardly had time to settle down when he sold the house and left the country. The dream he had had for so many years ended there. Harrison had thought of everything except the weather. Passage 39 Am I all right? While John Gilbert was in hospital, he asked his doctor to tell him whether his operation had been successful. But the doctor refused to do so. The following day, the patient asked for a bedside telephone. When he was alone, he telephoned the hospital exchange and asked for Dr. Millington. When the doctor answered the phone, Mr. Gilbert said he was inquiring about a certain patient, a Mr. John Gilbert. He asked if Mr. Gilbert's operation had been successful and the doctor told him that it had been. He then asked when Mr. Gilbert would be allowed to go home, and the doctor told him that he would have to stay in hospital for another two weeks. Then Dr. Millington asked the caller if he was a relative of the patient. No, the patient answered. I am Mr. John Gilbert. Passage 40. Food and Talk. Last week, at a dinner party, the hostess asked me to sit next to Mrs. Rumbold. Mrs. Rumbold was a large, unsmiling lady in a tight black dress. She did not even look up when I took my seat beside her. Her eyes were fixed on her plate and in a short time she was busy eating. I tried to make conversation. A new play is coming to the Globe soon, I said. Will you be seeing it? No, she answered. Will you be spending your holidays abroad this year? I asked. No, she answered. Will you be staying in England? I asked. No, she answered. In despair, I asked her whether she was enjoying her dinner. Young man, she answered, if you ate more and talked less, we would both enjoy our dinner. 